Hello, my name is Amy Laity. Uh, today is January 20th, 2009, and we're at the Genoa Branch Library in Genoa, Ohio. And as part of the Northwest Ohio Narratives Project produced by Norweld, um, I'm going to be talking to Marion Stevens today about her life in Ottawa County. First of all, Marion, because you were born a Stevens and you're a Stevens now, how do you currently spell your last name? How do I spell my last name? Mm -hmm. S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S. But my maiden name was S-T-E-V-E-N-S. -E and do we have your permission to record this in? This right. interview. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand you have deep roots in Ottawa County. You were born in. I was born in Toledo. In Toledo. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. But my fam, my parents were both Ottawa County people. My mother was uh, from Danbury. In fact, she was lived just uh, on the farm. It was a farmhouse. It's on, now only two doors from the keeper's house. And she was born there, and that's where her family roots were. And uh, then, but later on, she was taken with her grandmother into Lakeside and did most of her childhood in Lakeside. And uh, but my father was born on in Catawba, on Catawba Island on Rock Ledge. He was in the, born in the farmhouse that's up on the hill, as you go right up onto the ledge and go around the curve there. And, um, and that's where the Stevens family was, clear down Sand Road. But Grandpa Stevens uh, uh, became ill, and he didn't want to leave Grandma alone out there on the farm, so he sold all of the farm there and built a home for her in Port Clinton. So that's where the rest of my dad's life was in Port Clinton. But my mom's was in Lakeside. And, um, but um, I was born in Toledo, and so was my older brother, but my younger brother was born in Park Clinton. Mm -hmm. And but my dad loved to travel, and my mother, before she and my father were married, she had been in St. Petersburg, Florida. She worked on the St. Petersburg Times. And uh, she came up just for vacation, and my dad coaxed her into getting married. <laughs> So that's, she didn't get back there. But they always had that desire to, to see, my dad did, to see Florida because mom had told him about how nice it was down there. Is the Stevens a farmhouse still there? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, it is. And you said you were related through your mother's side to the Wolcott family? Right. Could you tell us a little bit about how... Their, their history with Ottawa County. Well, Benaja Wolcott had a son, Henry, and that was my great-grandfather. And um, his wife was Sophronia, and my mother was named for her. My mother's name was Iva Sophronia. And, and moms, and they had a daughter, Emma, and that was my mother's mother. So Emma is my grandmother, and Sophronia is my great-grandmother, and Henry is my great-grandfather. Benaja is my great-great-grandfather. And um, was your mother's family, they lived near the keeper's house? Yes, it said? was the farmhouse that was, at that time, it was the farmhouse that was right there by the keeper's house. And... Um, but uh, now uh, there is a, a small home that's between the farmhouse where mom was born and the keeper's house. But that building is still there, too. That building is still there. Uh -huh. Did you ever hear any stories passed down through, the, through your family about the lighthouse? And oh, oh, yes. Um, well, of course, see, Benaja was gone long before mom was born. My mother was born in 1891. And um, so uh, I, I don't recall anything other than they used to call it the old stone fort because it had some uh, holes in it and they thought it was a fort. But uh, Benaja Wolcott was a great friend of the Indians. 
So at one time when they had quite a, a uprising there, um, all the homes around were burned, but uh, the keeper's house wasn't touched because Benejo was a friend of the, the Indians. Have you visited the keeper's house? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, been down and gone through it. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, I have the um, a cherry chest that my granddaughter has that uh, Benejo Wolcott gave Henry when he and Sophronia was married. It's a beautiful big chest, all made of, of cherry wood. And we also have the uh, spool, it was called a spool bed then, a Jenny Lynn bed or whatever. And, um, and my granddaughter also has that bed. And that was the bed I always slept in when I was home. So when you uh, were growing up, did you visit in uh, Catawba Island and oh, yes. quite a bit? Yes, uh -huh. Catawba Island was, we, we'd always be taking trips down around Catawba Island and Lakeside. And um, of course, Port Clinton, you know, was so close to it. It was handy for us to get back and forth. How did you travel back and forth? Well, we had the cars in, uh -huh. but um, at the time mom and dad was married, dad didn't have a car, and uh, but they ran off to get married and I've never been able to find out just where, they're, where they got married. <laughs> I'm still looking. <laughs> and, uh, but. Um, so you, um, after living in the Toledo area for a while, you, your mother persuaded your father to return to Florida? Yes, they got to talk. Well, Dad always had that. He had sort of a, he was kind of an adventure person that he liked to travel. And that's when, um, well, let's see, I was six years old, and uh, we left. They packed up, and we decided to go to Florida. And in those days, uh, maybe you would make, oh, maybe 50, 75 miles a day. And because uh, there was no motels or anything, there, we had tents. And Dad fixed the car up. He had a, like a cabinet on the side of the car. And uh, that would, the door would fold down, and it had all the cooking equipment in there. And a trunk on the back of it. Can you imagine a <laughs> Model T Ford looking like this? And that's three kids in the back seat. <laughs> we started for Florida. And um, as we progressed, my uh, older brother wasn't feeling very well. So mom stopped at a couple times at the doctor and had him checked. And they said, well, it probably was change of weather. Water, you know, and, and things that all these things that could contribute to him not feeling well. And um, so they went on and they got down to High Point, North Carolina. And uh, Clifford was not getting any better. In fact, he was worse. So mother, mom stopped at, at a doctor there, stopped at the hospital. And the doctor, when he checked him, he says, this boy has a ruptured appendix. And so they put him in for operation right away. And the doctor came out and told my folks, he says, I don't believe in giving hope where there is no hope and there isn't any hope for this boy. And uh, being in the South there, they are very strong in the Baptist church. And evidently this doctor belonged to this church. It must have been on a Wednesday when they had prayer meeting because uh, he went to his church that night to prayer meeting, and he had the whole church and everybody in town praying for Clifford. And in those days, there was no penicillin, no antibiotics or anything like that. It was just drainage with tubes, and they pulled Clifford through, which was a miracle. And uh, we got all packed up already, but the people in high high. Point North Carolina was so good to our family. They just took us in and, you know, and just give us so much love. And 
they bring food and they would uh, just take care of my younger brother and myself. And um, it uh, was just the Southern hospitality was what it was. And um, mom has often said, I heard her say, she'd always have a soft spot in her heart for High Point, North Carolina, because of the way they were treated and everything. So we got all packed up, ready to head south again when we got Clifford out of the hospital. Dad went out, and of course, the Model T's, they had to be cranked. He took one hold of the crank and started to pull on it, and he grabbed his side, and he was back in the, he was in the hospital with appendicitis. So we were held up longer. But eventually we got started, and of course, Dad, his first trip down there, wanted to hit everything, so we were headed for Washington, D.C. We wanted to see everything there was to see going. And it also in those days, um, there was no route numbers. We followed what we called a woodpecker route. And that woodpecker route was just little marks on trees. That's the way we drove to Florida. <laughs> And when we would come to streams that didn't have a bridge across them, Dad would get out and walk up and down and size the, the water up and see if we could get through it. Of course, the Model T's were kind of a high car. And away we'd go through the streams. And uh, we got into Washington, and I think we covered everything there. We were to Mount Vernon, and I can remember my one, real, one little memory of Mount Vernon after going through was a little spinning wheel that you could put your finger on and on the pedal and, and push it and to make the wheel go around. And I just treasured that. And uh, I kept that for a long, long time. I had it when we were in Florida and always had it on my chest in my bedroom. And so we got on and we made it into St. Petersburg. And uh, when we got there, we stopped at a place that was called Lewis Tent City. But the tents weren't tents there. They were like little cottages with the tent over the top of them. They had sort of a canvas roofing. <laughs> so um, we stayed there till the folks was looking around and they bought some property that was kind of out at the edge of St. Petersburg. And... Um, they got a lot there, and, start, and Dad started. He was very handy. My dad was very artistic. He had gone to um, Cleveland Art School, and he was very handy at painting cars. And in those days, everything was done by hand. And uh, so the first thing he did was build a, a big garage that would be at the back of our house there. That was going to be his business then. And at the one end of the garage, they had a completely closed room, all sealed and everything. No dust could get into it. And a car would be put in there, and Dad would paint that by hand. And when he got through, it would look like a mirror. You couldn't see a brush mark or anything. And even if it had a stripe around under the windows or anything, he did that all by hand. And um, so... It was quite rustic where we lived out there. It was, uh, there weren't too many houses around, and but they finally got our place built. And just before it was completely built, it was one of the worst hurricanes that came up in 1925. And uh, we were in this house that wasn't <laughs> complete, you know, and... Uh, that day we had been, we went downtown, and the way they notified people in, because we didn't have televisions or anything, and we did have a little radio that Dad would bring the uh, battery in from the car that he had to hook up so that we could have a little radio. And uh, But we drove out by the pier, and they had a flag that they would put up when there was hurricane time, and that would signal us. And we had gone uptown to get groceries. And we saw that, and the wind started to come in pretty strong, and so we headed for home. And it kept getting stronger and stronger, and we had a neighbor that had a house that was complete, and it was a, a brick era, a 
you know, not a cement brick and um, very stable. And they just had one little baby. And so they had one of the other neighbors down the street because there weren't too many of us around. They had that family who had three children and we had three children in our family. They had us come over and we all stayed together in their place during the hurricane. And they put beds together and put us, all, us kids all in, <laughs> crossed in the beds. And that's why we, we slept through the hurricane. Can you remember what the sound was like of oh, the hurricane? Yeah, yeah I can. And uh, I remember that it, was, uh, it blew one of the windows out in one, in one of our bedrooms there in, the, in our place. And uh, Dad would want to go over every once in a while to check, you know, to see how things were at our place. And, uh, of course, we'd worry about him till he'd get back. It was just a lot between us. And, uh, but it, it was a terrific wind and rain. And so that was before they named hurricanes, I take it? Pardon me? That was before hurricanes were given names? Yes, yes, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. No, they didn't have and names. What year was that again? 1925. 1925. Mm -hmm. So was your home damaged? No, no, we got through it real good, except for that blowing that one window out. Mm -hmm. But that, that was the only thing. How long did you live in Florida then? We were there um, for seven, I had my first seven years of schooling there. And, but in the meantime, we would, in the summer, once or twice we came north to see Grandma Stevens. And, uh, but uh, all of us went to school there. And, and then my mother got a job in the cafeteria there. So she would be there when we when had lunches and that she'd see that we kids had lunches. And because they didn't have school cafeterias, they had a little... Um, the next three little building outside of the school, and that's where Mom did the cooking and uh, would fix the lunches. And then they had uh, a board drop down for their window, and she'd have that raised up, and they have a little counter there, and the kids would file through to pick up their sand. It was mostly sandwiches and maybe soup or something like that, and that they'd have for their meal or at noon, and. Um, but mom, then she did this all by hand, by herself. And I can remember, recall her with a great big heavy mop. It had a wooden floor and she'd have to mop that floor every night and take care of all the dishes. Everything was done by hand. But she wanted to be close to see that we kids had our lunches and everything like we should have. Um, so you said you came back to um, Ottawa County several times in the summers. And yeah, we'd come back, uh -huh, then go back to, to our place in Florida. So about how long, How would that take a week to drive up here or longer? Well, it probably would because I have read, Mom had a little booklet she kept, and if they would make, uh, at that time when we'd be going back and forth, if they'd make 100 miles a day, they were doing pretty good. Well, that took quite a while to get north. So I imagine it would take a couple weeks to get home, one way and both ways. Um, there was something about your uh, daughter-in-law was telling me you had, had to back over the mountains. Oh, yes. Well, that's when we were, uh, yes, when we, I said when we were get, going down to Washington, of course, that was in the worst of the mountains. And um, that... Um, they didn't have, you know, they didn't break through and go around mountains like we do now. You had to go up and over the mountains. And of course, that was a Model T that didn't have the gas feed like we have in cars now. And so we would get up pretty close to the top of a mountain and you could, it wouldn't draw gas, see? So dad would have to turn the car around and back up the rest of the way to the top of the mountain so we could start down again. And the way we, the gas tank was right underneath the front seats. It was a, just a little tank. And the way Dad would check the gas, because it didn't have any uh, meters or anything on it, it had just a little thing where they poured the gas in. Uh, he had a yardstick, and he'd dip down there to see how much gas he had in there. And... Uh, 
I can remember this one time, we was coming down the mountain and uh, it was a steep, steep uh, drop, you know, coming down. And, and Dad, uh, he had his foot on the brake and it still wasn't breaking good and he had the emergency brake pulled and we were just letting out a whole big streak of, of smoke all the way down the mountain. <laughs> but we made it. <laughs> uh, how old were you when you permanently moved back to this area from Florida? Well, that was, uh, see, my first seven years. Then we came back in uh, just 1930. We got back up here, and Dad would get a job when he would come up here. He worked. He had a job there. We'd come to Grandma's, and he got a job at the American Gypsum Company there in, in outside of Port Clinton. And Dad being, like I say, artistic and everything, he did stippling uh, samples for the American gypsum. And um, he, so he had his job, and then that's when the Depression hit. And we had our home in Florida, and the folks had purchased 20 acres over in Bradenton, Florida. And it wiped everything out. We were completely... Everything, everything we had was gone. And and they had, I was ready to go into junior high and my brother was to going into senior high. And uh, we were all in school and uh, so the folks said, well, uh, we would just, dad had his job here, we stayed here. So they found a place, first we went, we found a place in Lakeside that we rented for the summer till we found a place in Port Clinton because they wanted to have a place closer to Grandma. And uh, so we found they found a house there in Port Clinton. But then we had no furniture, so they went out and they got used furniture. It was a used Davenport, used chairs, everything was used. And I can remember when Mom and Dad took us there the first time, and she stood with tears running down her face that we had a home that had some furniture. What was the, what were the depression years like in Clinton? Well, it, uh, at least we had work, but it wasn't uh, bountiful. I mean, uh, um, it was, uh, everybody was in the same situation and um, but and it was surprising how much you could how you could stretch meat and things like that to make put food on the like for us for five five in the family and and children that are good eaters <laughs> and um, but mom always managed it and at that time uh, we found there were a lot of uh, men you know that wandered the streets. They would come in on the, on the trains and that, and they would come through past our place and knock on the door and ask if, if they could have any food or anything. Mom never, never turned anybody away. If it was no more than a slice of bread with some peanut butter or something on it to give to them. And, um, but it was, it was a tough time. And I can remember, um, and then, uh, these were the days in, in 30 to 34. I graduated in 1934. It, um, high school days, and it comes to your junior and senior proms and that. And I didn't know what kind of dress I would wear. And I remember Mom and I had gone to Toledo, and we were looking around. And um, I saw a dress. It was a white satin dress with a little bolero jacket with had little white fur around it and oh I just stood there admiring that so it was so pretty mom said would you like that for your prom I said oh mom we can't and she dug down in her pocketbook she had saved pennies and nickels and whatever she could she had that dress was five dollars she bought that dress for me so I would have that dress for the prom and uh, then we kept that dress. In 1937, I was married. That was my wedding dress. 
because we were still pulling out of the Depression. And uh, we had a neighbor that was seamstress, and sh she took lace and covered this dress with lace. And that was my wedding dress when I was married in 1937. So um, after you graduated, before you met your, your husband, what did you go on to school, uh, any kind of no, school, or you worked? Uh, no, because, see, I was going with my husband. He lived in Genoa. His family all was settled around here, and they were settlers from way back here in, around Genoa and Clay Center. And um, my mom said she would send me. I wanted to go into um, cosmetic school and uh, because I was always handy at fixing hair and everything. And uh, she says, uh, she always wanted me to be a teacher. And she says, now we, Marion, she says, uh, it'll be a struggle for Dad and I. But w if you would go to Bowling Green, she says, we'll, we'll manage, we'll work it out some way that we'll send you. But she says, I don't want you to get graduated one day and get married the next. She says, because we just couldn't handle that. And uh, I wouldn't make any promises. So Gordon and I was married in 1937. And uh, he, he graduated from TU the, the year that I graduated from high school in 1934. Where did you meet him? His aunt lived next door to us in Port Clinton. That's how I met him. And um, so when we were married, uh, we moved to Toledo then because that's where his work was. And, um, and his name was? Ms. Gordon Klaus. Gordon Klaus. Mm -hmm. He said his family had, was um, well settled in this area. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. They were well known. Uh -huh. They had lived here for years. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, we were in uh, Toledo then. We had a little apartment, a four-family apartment. And then, uh, well, then we moved into another fa a house by ourselves. And it seemed like every time we would move into a place, we'd get it all fixed up and paint and get it all papered and fixed up, it would sell. So we had to move, I think it was about five times in six years we had to move. <laughs> so then we ended up in a, in a double, du du an upper and lower duplex. And uh, Gordon, it was over off of Bancroft at that time, near TU. And uh, behind that, um, let's see, no. Yeah, well, they had a spot where we could have gardening. And uh, we put in what we call a victory garden. <laughs> and we had some friends, real close friends of ours, and um, Romaine and George Smith, and they both had come from Toledo. And they had gone to school. Uh, George had gone to school at TU with Gordon, and they were close, and then, so Romaine and I became close, and we were friends for over 70 years before she passed away. And they finally ended up in Port Clinton. They had the uh, automotive parts in Port Clinton. And um, when she, she and George, then they passed away. And uh, so... Uh, but that was later on. Let's see, I'm getting ahead of my story here a little bit, I guess. What did Gordon study at the university? He was uh, in uh, business accounting. So he, was, he worked for the France Stone Company in the uh, accounting department. And then he went into the purchasing department and was worked, he was purchasing agent. And... Um, then he, I don't know, he uh, kind of got uh, despondent about, I don't know if he was unsettled about working, that um, he was in between jobs and he quit. And, um, but in the meantime, while we lived, I, as I say, I got a little ahead here, but when we lived there by, on Offenbrandcroft, he would go down and take the bus to work. 
and he met this lady that they always stood there, and she got to talking with him and said that her daughter was um, selling their home that was out in Mount Vernon Addition off of Door Street there. It was right across from the big Tidkey home. Do you remember Tidkey's there in, Park, in Toledo? Mm -hmm. It was an enormous store. And uh, this was, uh, they were quite a, a well-known family there in, in Toledo. And uh, this Mount Vernon Edition was right across from that. And she said that they wanted to sell their home, and would we be would was Gordon interested? He says, "Well, he'd like to see it." And so she brought a picture, and he brought it home and showed me. And he and she said, "Well, she'd take us out and show it to us." So we went out there and looked at it, and we both fell in love with it, and we bought that house. And uh, then he was working for Ernst and Ernst, the accountants. And that meant a lot of traveling around, and that's when my younger son, Dwight, was born, when we lived there. And um, so I had this baby, and, and Gordon, it, when it come to um, income time, you know, at the first of the year, when they had to make up taxes and everything, and he had to do a lot of traveling around to businesses, he didn't like leaving me alone there with the baby. So he quit that job, and uh, in the meantime, we went. Then we went to Florida. But uh, he had gone with my dad one time in northern Michigan, and um, they, he said he wanted to take a trip up there. So he and Dad went up there and drove around on Burt Lake, which is twenty-five miles from the Straits, and. Uh, he uh, said he had an uncle that uh, had lived up there in, on this Burt Lake, and he was caretaker of a home there. And um, he says, I'd like to find that place. So they looked around, and they found where Uncle John had had his place there. Gordon said he remembered the old farmhouse, he said, because his folks had come up when he was in high school and visited, because that was his mother's brother. And um, so that made him interested in that up there. Well, it ended up he and Dad came back. They met a man there, and they were subdividing lots in there. And he and Dad came back, and between the two of them, they bought property there on Burt Lake, which was a 100-foot strip right on the lakefront and 400-some feet deep. And... Uh, so he and Dad decided that they would put a cottage up there. So he and Dad went up there and built a cement block house or cottage with two bedrooms, you know, that was just a nice, cozy little cottage right on the road because you couldn't even see the lake. It was all, all uh, forest around there. And, and beautiful lake, though, if you've ever been in northern Michigan. And... Um, so uh, it came to where we decided between the two, the dad and, and Gordon, they said, well, gee, we could maybe put some other cottages down in front and then, uh, you know, rent them. And um, if it would be cleared off and everything. But he and dad built that little cottage all by hand. They did all the digging. They dug trees out by hand. Everything was done by hand poured cement for the floor by hand, just the two of them. They got that cottage up, and we lived in that cottage when we'd go up there. And then uh, this one, the one winter then, and my folks would go back to Florida because they had their home in Florida. And uh, they, uh, they had gone to Florida and wanted us to come down. Well, we, w we stayed up there till Christmas time. We came down Genoa and had Christmas with his folks here and then went on to Florida. Well, we got down there, and his mother was failing. And um, after we had been there for a while in Florida, they, um, his dad had written and said his mother was not doing good at all, so Gordon said, we better come back and look after her. So um, we came back to, to Genoa, and so we lived with Gordon's folks because he was an only child. And... Um, we lived with them, and in that we came back in 1948.
and she passed away then about a year later and about 49. Well, he, we just got back and his dad had gone uptown. And of course, everybody, it was like one big family here in Genoa then. And Gordon's dad knew everybody and every business because they had, had a grocery store here. And um, they, they lived uh, right on Main Street when their first grocery store that they had before they built their home they had an apartment above it, and that's where Gordon was born. And that's where Alton Bolin, had, and then I think there was one of the businesses in there now. I think it's a Strauss or an insurance business that's in there now. And um, So that's where the grocery store was? or Yeah, up above mm -hmm. there. Uh -huh. and the, the grocery store was so, down below. Oh, and they lived upstairs. And they lived up above, and that's where Gordon was born. And uh, But then... Uh, as I say, his dad knew everybody here in Genoa. And um, so um, he got to talking to the man that was in the bank there. And he told him that Gordon was here and told him his background, that he had this background of uh, accounting. And um, so um, Mr. Boland said that they needed a man in the bank there and for him to send Gordon over. Well, it ended up that Gordon got the job of, so he was cashier there in the Genoa Bank. And um, so that's where we were. And then 11 years later, he was taken sick with cancer. And, uh, but in the, before he got sick, we had gone up north. We got, um, they had cleared off. He had helped them. We had uh, bulldozers come in and clean off the lots and everything. And he was he helped he even got down there and helped him, and uh, we had it all cleared off and everything. We had a pre-cut log cabin that we put down on the lakefront, and um, we had uh, friends that had gone up with us, and his his cousin had bought property next to us because they had come up and they liked it so well up there. They bought property next to us and had put up just what they called a little, uh, just a little place that they could go up and stay, you know, while they'd be up there. And um, so we had friends that went up with us here, uh, Max and Jenny Galdine, and um, they just loved it up there. And Max said, if Al ever wants to sell that property, he says, you give me, tell him to give me first chance. Well, it came that Al and Betty, they lived down in Indiana. They didn't get up there very often. So they uh, had, um, they said that they were going to sell. And um, they, uh, it ended up that Max and Jenny brought the property right next to us. So we ordered two log cabins, and they both came in at the same time. And uh, they we got those cottages up in two weeks. They had them all roughed in with a little bit of extra help, but uh, they worked <laughs> night and day <laughs> getting them up. And when we got back, uh, Gordon wasn't feeling too good, and uh, he started feeling. We went over to the doctor, and that was in 1959. And he just kept going downhill and downhill, and uh, they thought it was nerves at first, and they couldn't put their finger on just what it was. They did all kinds of testing. And in September, uh, they took him in, and he had surgery for cancer. After Gordon was uh, diagnosed with cancer and had surgery, what, what happened after that? Well, when he had his surgery in September, in November then, we, uh, we, went, we flew to Florida, our first trip. We were both scared to death. And... <laughs> Lo and behold, it was an awful snowy night, and the, the plane was loaded with, they had to de-ice the, uh, the wings and everything. And then when we, we flew into over, to, we were going to land in Tampa, it was fl uh, fogged in. We had to go on clear to Miami, get off the plane, and wait till we get a plane and get back to, Saint, to Tampa again. And my folks didn't know we were coming. We wanted to surprise them. And uh, which was a good thing because they would have been worried and worried with us floating around like that. 
And um, so we, we got back to uh, Tampa then, and we took a limousine and got over to my folks' place and surprised them. And uh, so we stayed there till, well, it was Christmas in uh, Christmas time, and uh, they wanted to stay and have Christmas with them. And, and Gordon says, no, we better go home and be with the boys for Christmas. And um, so we came home and had Christmas here with our boys. And, and he went back to work for half a day and was seemed to be, you know, co recuperating pretty good. But then I noticed he would come home because we were only about, a block away from the bank there where we lived. He would come home for lunch, and I was noticing that it was hard for him to, you know, that he wasn't eating right. And uh, so one day when he'd gone back, I called his doctor in Toledo and talked to him, and he said, well, Mrs. Klaus, he says, you know what can happen. Maybe it's a reoccurrence. And uh, so... Um, Lo and behold, that's what it was. So they had him in the hospital again. And now this went along. We got back and had Christmas. And it was about in February, and I think it was March, when he had surgery again. And they put a tube in his side, and I fed him in that tube in his side. And But he had such an urge to get back to that lake. He thought we had spring water there and everything. He thought if he'd get back up there, that everything, you know, that he'd, he'd get better. And so he got strong enough that uh, we packed up, just the two of us, because our boys was here with Grandpa. And um, we got back up, and he drove part of the way up in Michigan, and then I drove. And uh, we got to the lake, and the first thing he got out and went right over where he could get a glass of that water, and he stood there and took a swallow, and it wouldn't go through. And uh, then I could see him going down, down, and down. And I thought, how in the world am I going to get him home? And about that time, here comes Grandpa Klaus. <laughs> he had driven up, and I told him that, uh, and my folks was coming up from Florida, and um, I told him, I said, well, I said, uh, I, I said, we'll follow you. I said, I'm going back. So he drove ahead of me, and then I followed him and drove back, got Gordon back, and we got him back to Flower, the old Flower Hospital. And they took him in, and they said, well, it's just a matter of time. Now, this was June, and our anniversary was in June the 26th. And uh, I can remember, he said when it came on our anniversary, he says, well, honey, he, we can't do anything now, but we'll make up for it later. And August 6th, he passed away. And what year was that? 1960. 1960. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned your, your boys before. How many children did you have with Gordon? Just my two boys, two boys. Donald and Dwight. Mm -hmm. And Don was the oldest. He was almost six years, about five and a half years older than Dwight. Um, another uh, story that uh, one of your family members told me was that the grocery store was robbed at one time. Oh, now she, I think she mentioned that to me, and I hadn't been aware mm -hmm. of that. So I didn't know. That was the probably the Klaus, the Klaus grocery. grocery store. Uh-huh. And... Uh, the man that worked for um, for Grandpa Klaus was um, Hes his name was Hesselbart and uh, Clarence Hesselbart, and um, later on he I married his son-in-law, <laughs> who was Clarence Stevens, <laughs> it, because um, when Gordon passed away. Alice and I taught uh, Sunday school together over here at St. John's. And, um, but I didn't know Steve because he was in the sheriff's department at that time. And uh, he was down at the other end of the county most of the time. And I wasn't acquainted with him. 
So I had no connection with him, but Alice and I would, and she was kind of failing. She had diabetes very bad. And um, so it affected her heart. And But she sang at my husband's funeral. She and her sister sang at my husband's funeral. And so there was a lot of family connections there. And um, so, um, let's see. Uh, get this in order here, uh, how it was. Uh, that when Gordon passed away uh, in August, I had my, I had talked to mom. I, I tell you uh, I, how I said, how uh, God kind of works in mysterious ways for us. Uh, when, when I had Gordon up to the lake there and he was so sick, I don't think I've even told my children about this. I was sitting on the bed and I was wondering what in the world I was going to do because I had a boy yet to get through high school and through college. And here I wasn't equipped for anything too much to do and uh, wondering what in the world I could do that I could take care of him. And here we had the property up north. And like I was, and Gordon was in bed there, and I was sitting on the bed there and looking down the lake, and it was such a beautiful day. The sun was out, the sky was just as blue, and I was looking down at the lake, and uh, just as clear as anything out of this world was written across the sky, teach. And when, 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 my, when I got my mom, a hold of my mom, I said, Mom, come on, I want to take a walk with you. And that's when Gordon was sick, see. And um, I walked down the road with her, and I said, Mom, I think I know what I'm going to do if it's possible. I says, I, and when I was in high school, I had taken a college course, which was a godsend. And um, I says, I think maybe if I can get into Bowling Green, I'm going to start in, and maybe I can teach. And that would uh, get me, and it would give me summers that I would be with Dwight. We could take care of things up at the lake because we wanted to keep that. And um, so I started, uh, uh, we sent, she says, well, honey, when I get down there, she says, I'll contact Superintendent Ford, and she says, I'll get the arrangements, get your credits and everything. Well, everything just went so smooth. They got all my credits, sent them to Bowling Green. I was accepted, went over, and I took the exam, and I passed the exam. And uh, I was slated to start in in September. Gordon passed away in August, and in September, I was started with 15 hours load. <laughs> and had been out of school for 26 years. And uh, so, did you drive back and forth to Bowling Green every day? I took night classes. I took day classes whenever I could get a class. I took to get my hours in and credits. And uh, it came in um, 1962. A Superintendent Roberts here at Genoa called me and he says, Mary, and he says, we're going to have an opening in, down in Allen Central School. He said, uh, first grade, he says, would you be interested? And that's what I was interested in, first or second grade. And uh, I says, I sure would if I have credits enough. We added up my credits. I had just exactly 82 credits, and that got me in on the cadet program. So I got the certificate that I could start teaching. Could you explain a little bit what the cadet program was? was well, that was for uh, the cadet. You don't. You can start teaching on that, but you don't have to have your BS degree. And, um, but you have to continue. So that meant when I was teaching that I had to continue taking classes. So I picked up classes nights, summers, whenever I could get hours in to go in towards my uh, getting my degree. So it took me 11 years to get that. But in uh, then going back to when Gordon passed away, seven months later, Alice, who was Steve's wife, the Hes she was a Hesselbart, and the connection with the Klaus family and everything, uh, she passed away, and uh, 
but uh, there was times when we were teaching Sunday school that she would call me and she'd say, well, I don't feel too good, but she says, I have things planned here because she knew I was working, studying a lot and everything. I, and um, she said, uh, I've got things here, but I'll send them over with Steve and he can give them to you for Sunday. And, uh, but I didn't know Steve. And um, I said, well, I says, you never know. I says, if I'm going to be home because I have classes and if I'm not here, she says, I'll just have him put it in the mailbox. Well, there were two or three times that she sent things over and there was never once that I was home that I ever met him. <laughs> but um, he, I would have the material in the mailbox. And uh, so in 1962, that spring, we were, I had gone, I had gone to church that morning and come home and we had dinner. And when I'd get a little blue, I'd go to the cemetery. It seemed to kind of make me feel better. And I coming back, uh, Charlotte and Joe Latham, who had the super dollar here at that time, the big, whose Miller is at Miller store now, um, they were good friends, and so I thought, oh, I'll stop and see Charlotte and Joe. And um, so I stopped in there and visited with them, and Joe says, Mary, why don't you stop, stay and have supper with us? I says, no, we had our dinner, and no, I says, uh, there's no need in me staying for supper. He coaxed and coaxed. He says, I'm going out and close the store at 6 o'clock, because that's when they close stores at 6 on Sunday. And... Um, so I said, well, on one condition then, Grandpa had planted lettuce, and this was in early part of June. And I says, that's just coming up nice. I says, I'll go home and get some lettuce and make wilted lettuce. And I knew Joe liked wilted lettuce. So that was their plan. So I ran home and got lettuce and came back, and, and Charlotte and I was working in the kitchen, and she says, I don't know what's taking Joe so long to get the store closed up. So... Joe finally came in, and he wandered around the kitchen a little bit. Pretty soon he said to me, Mary and I did something. I hope you won't object. And I says, what's that? He says, well, I went by Steve. I knew this Steve had every other weekend off when he was in the sheriff's department. And he says he was painting on his house. He was up on the ladder. And uh, he says, I stopped there and talked to him and told him you were come, I mean, we were going to have you out for supper and would he like to come out for supper? And he said he came right down off of that ladder, and he says, yeah, I'll go in and get showered. I'll be right out. <laughs> and uh, so he came out, and we had supper. We played pinochle, and, and uh, he just, uh, we just seemed to click. Just seemed to be that we were supposed to meet each other and be with each other. Now, you called him Steve. That was a nickname for his last name? Yeah, they always called him Steve, yeah, for Stevens, but his name was Clarence. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was getting ready to go pack Dwight up, was getting the car packed. I was going to the lake, and here I just met him. So uh, we, we, we were together then, and then when I got ready to leave for the lake, uh, the next time that he had the other weekend off, he saw my older son, Don, uptown there, and he said, Don, he says, how about going up and seeing your mom? He said, uh, I've got a weekend off. He says, I could get off, I get off at midnight on Friday. He says, we could take off right away when I get home from work. So that started it. So he'd come up every other weekend when I was at the lake. And that following December, we were married, December 22nd which was my oldest son's birthday, and he walked me down the aisle. Mm -hmm. nice. And Steve became part of the family then. Mm -hmm. And that's why I became a Stevens again. <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, um, let's go back a few years. Okay. Um, what did you do for fun in Genoa when your children were small and... And uh, what did I do for fun? Yeah. Well, I belonged to a club here, the Athenian Club. And, um, and I was 
active in PTA, and, the, and Don was in the band, so I was with the music, mothers and fathers and that group. And, um, and then uh, I helped out a lot uh, with uh, Reverend Rohrball when he was here with the Youth Fellowship until I started in, gotten kind of bogged down with schooling. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it came time to me to graduate too from Bowling Green, I went to Bowling Green and walked down with the rest of them with my cap and gown on. I says I had worked 11 years for it, so that's... So what was that like to go to school with being older than your well, peers? Well, yeah. there was a lot of other ones, and then... Um, there were girls here, uh, Rosie, she's Rosie Motter now, she was Rosie Booth. Her husband was the uh, coach here. And uh, she uh, went to school, she started in the classes too. So we drove back and forth together a lot. And then we picked up a couple um, from Elmore and then another one from Lindsay. And so we, we had, old, there was older ones, you know, that were getting degrees, working toward degrees. And maybe they had uh, started, you know, earlier and then broke it off and they wanted to go back and pick it up again. So it, it, it didn't, well, of course, I wasn't active in any of the things in, in college like you would when you're young. How long did you teach? At Allen Central then? Well, I taught at Allen Central for um, 13 years, and then when I retired, and that's when Steve was made sheriff in 1970, and this was in 1973, I drove back and forth from Port Clinton for three years to teach up here at Allen Central. And um, so... Um, what? First grade all that time? or No, I went into second grade. Okay. I taught first grade two years, and then I went into the second grade and taught the rest of the time in second grade. And um, then uh, there, Bill Polk was principal in at the elementary school, which was right over uh, about a block from the jail. We had to live in the jail then. You know, we had to move down and live in the jail. That's another story. <laughs> Well, let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we lived in the jail. When Steve went down there, we had, the, at that time, the sheriff lived, and it was the old jail. And Where was that located? In, right there by the courthouse in okay. Port Clinton. And um, so Bill Pope, I saw him on the street one day, and he says, Boy, Marion, he, he had taught up here at Allen Central when I had taught. And he says, if I had an opening over here, he says, I'd sure like to have you on our staff. I says, no, Bill, I've, I've resigned now, and that's it. And I guess it was just about the following week, I had, Mom and I had gone to Toledo, and we come home, and Steve says, I got some papers. Bill Pope was over here. He has some, Pope, has some papers for you to fill out. I says, uh-uh. He, he's talking, ta uh, teaching again. And I says, I, I'm not going to let him talk me into it. So I went over to see Bill, and I told him, Bill, no. I says, I, I've quit now, and that's it. He says, come on, walk down the hall with me. We walked down the hall, and he, he says, look at this room here. He says, this is the first grade. He says, this is your room. <laughs> it ended up that I signed a contract, and I taught for a year there, but my mom was failing, and we had, uh, I w you know, was trying to take care of her, and I was trying to help Steve there because I had duties there because I was matron at the jail. And, um, and then planning menus, and I had records, and I had, there was a lot to do. Did you have to prepare meals? Well, we had a cook that came in, and then mom did a lot of the cooking. At the, she came at the, and helped us, too. And that, oh, boy, she just loved that. And, uh, in fact, she just babied them too much, Steve said, because <laughs> making them homemade cookies and, and anything, you know, she was always uh, making special things. He says, this is a jail. <laughs> and uh, so and the way we fed them there, we had a little um, door at, on, right above the, in the counter where we uh, worked 
there and, and we get their trays all fixed up. When it came meal time, they came and pushed their trays through and then we would put all the food on and then push it through to them, through this little door in underneath the cupboards. And uh, so there, you know, there wasn't much privacy or anything, although we had the upstairs and I fixed a living room up there and mom had a nice big bedroom and we had our big bedroom in our upstairs there. And then we had downstairs, we had like a dining room that was off from the, it was a big kitchen and then a big summer kitchen there. Is that building still there? No, they tore it down, which it was over a hundred years old and I said, it's just broke my heart because that should have been a museum. It should have been kept because I said for children coming up in later years, they don't realize how the sheriff had to live. Did, were there women prisoners there too, or did you just They had an upstairs for prisoners and children, minors, juvenile. So you said that you were the matron, so you, what did, what did you have to do? I guess is well, just records, and uh, I made up menus and uh, kind of oversee everything. And so, did you get paid for your work? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just didn't know if that was part, of, since mm -hmm. you were the sheriff's wife, if that was. Yeah, see, because <laughs> I was considered matron. Uh -huh. Okay. That was a job. Uh -huh. But I had all these other things to do. And. Um, so that we lived there, then Steve retired in 1977. Then we took mom, and she had a stroke just the fall before we retired. And, but we did get her down to Florida for two winters. And the last time we brought her up, I says, I can't do it another winter, <laughs> another time. It was getting almost mm -hmm. more than I could handle because she was beginning to get confused Mom was just a month short of 90 when she passed away. Did you fly on those other trips, or were you back in the car for a long car trip to Florida? When you oh, would take we would do it by car. Uh -huh. A lot yeah. different than those yeah. later trips, uh -huh. though. But uh, Steve and I took a lot of trips. Uh, we um, There was one trip that was uh, on, on the Ohio State teacher's trip that that I never will forget, because it's a place I always wanted to go was Switzerland. And it was a trip from uh, Christmas Day to New Year's Day. And we went on that trip, and we flew into Zurich, and we stayed in Lucerne, and we had a, a week there. And it was all during Christmas time, and they had New Year's, we had New Year's there. And uh, my food, you never saw such food. <laughs> or tasted such food. <laughs> well, you've seen a lot of changes in the county. Yes. Uh -huh. So, um, yeah, that's, I'm not, I'm not sure where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. um, well, there, yeah, there's been a lot of changes with, um, well, I often think how Steve drove back and forth, you know, every day, the changes that he saw in uh, just going up 163 and back mm -hmm. every day of the, of the building, you know, outside of Oak Harbor and, and all along the way there, how the difference. So you're living back in Genoa now. And we, yes, uh-huh. Yeah, we... Um, well, we, we stayed and we went back and forth from Florida. We stayed in, and after mom passed away, we had the home down there until 1996 when we sold it. And because it was getting harder to get back and forth, you know. And, uh, and then Steve was, he started in with dementia. And uh, so um, we sold that down there, and uh, but we still had what we call our that's our home in Michigan, because when Steve got into the family, we did with that little log cabin. He added on to it, and 
And we did so much, you know, refurbishing on it that it's just a nice home. So you still go up there? Oh, yes. I got up there for this past summer with Dwight and uh, Phyllis. They took me up when in the summer. We were up there for two weeks, and then they went up to close their place in um, in October. We were up there for almost the whole month of October when the colors were on. And, uh, and then, well, then uh, we... With, with, uh, we thought we could stay up the lake, and the kid says, no, not for the winters. Although we had a furnace, you know, the baseboard heating put in and everything, and and uh, we thought we could stay there, but they said the distance that we had to get our car out up to the road there, that it was too dangerous because I had had heart surgery, and and I'd had a lot of problems. And then with Steve, with, he was starting in with dementia, and and uh, they said it would be better maybe if we'd come back and be closer. So we got our place here at uh, Edgewood Manor over there by the church. Mm -hmm. And so we've been there now. It'll be 12 years in November. And my, my Steve passed away just a year ago this month. Uh, he would have been 96 mm -hmm. in three weeks. He just missed that by three weeks. Uh -huh. Yeah, but we had a wonderful life together, and 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 this is so nice here because my my all of my grandchildren and I have uh, greats, and I have eight grandchildren and uh, twelve greats. So, uh, and they're all within. I'd say about 15 miles. The furthest from me is my oldest granddaughter. She lives in Northwood. <laughs> and that's not too far. Well, you've certainly seen a lot of changes, and uh, it's really been so interesting talking with you. Thank you so much for coming in today. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you'd like to, to share with people who would watch this? Uh, DVD? Well, I think I've covered uh, pretty much I, so that my children will know what my childhood was like and uh, the differences in the um, transportation starting out with a Model T. Mm -hmm. Did you take the, the trolley back and forth to Toledo a lot? or? Yes, when we lived in Port Clinton, that's the way we went to Toledo. On the inner urban, mm -hmm. go to Toledo to shop, or yes, uh huh. At this big Tidkey store that I was telling you about, <laughs> uh, that was a, that was a store that everybody loved to go to, and uh, it was on a big corner there on uh, on um, Summit Street, and. Uh, but the changes in Toledo and is drastic. What when I go past there and and the, all the expressways and everything, you know how different it is. Not exactly a woodpecker trail, are they? <laughs> no, I should say not. No, uh, uh And you know we got used to driving when we're up at the lake there. It's all country roads, and we're near Sheboygan in Mackinac. And the big bridge up there, we're 25 miles from them for that. And uh, so um, I hope I've uh, cleared everything for my kids to know. And But, but Vanaja, going back to Vanaja now, and uh, I have pictures here. And my mother was named for Sophronia. Her name was Iva Sophronia. Sophronia. And that would have been Benaja's granddaughter? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great granddaughter. Great my granddaughter. My mother okay. would be great. Uh, and I'm great, great granddaughter of Benaja. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I would be the oldest living descendant of his? Descendant of his or not. 
Mm -hmm. Be interesting to find out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was Catawba Island like when you were, and we think of it as being such a oh, busy place that was now. Peach orchards everywhere you look was peach orchards. Catawba Island. Yeah. We just loved to go driving around there in the spring, you know, and when they'd be in blossom and and then when they got in fruit, when you get the fruit, about every farmhouse, you know, had stand out in front with beaches. And that's getting more sparse now. And what was the lakeside like? Um, oh. You said your grandmother lived in Lakeside? Was yes, it? my mom. See, mom was raised by Grandma Wolcott. Mm -hmm. uh, because mom's mother and dad were both gone. Uh, I guess her dad died when she was five and her mother died when she was 10. So she was raised by Grandma, who was uh, Benage's uh, daughter-in-law. So Mom was raised by her. Mm -hmm. I don't and, know if we said that uh, Benage was the light, first lighthouse keeper and he was the, the first, first permanent keeper, settler uh -huh. in Ottawa County. Uh -huh. And his wife, Rachel, was the first lady uh, white uh, lighthouse keeper after he passed away. She took his duties. And can you imagine a woman carrying the oil? You know, they had to light those uh, lamps with oil, carrying them up those steps. I can't imagine it. And, uh, and we descend from uh, Rachel, that, who was his second wife. And, uh, yeah, Mom, and, you know, Mom went to millinery school in Chicago. And uh, I have oh, little, that's interesting. little dimes when Mom was there. Of course, she, Grandma, you know, she was under Grandma's care. And um, Grandma would send her a dime, and she'd take a little piece of cloth and put over this dime and stitch around it. And it would be just in a little square cloth. And Mom still kept some of those, and I still have them. These dimes that were wrapped up, sewed up in that little cloth that Grandma Wolcott had uh, stowed for and sent to her, a dime. But Mom went into millinery school there in Chicago. They had relatives that lived there, and she lived with them while she was there. So did you have a lot of hats? <laughs> A lot of what? A lot of hats. <laughs> hats. <laughs> yeah, Mom liked liked hats. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And and she was handy at doing things with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, I think I'm out of questions. Yeah. The uh, I don't know if there's anything more along in the uh, from the descendant line that I could give you any more information on. Uh, other than uh, I know that uh, Benaja was quite musical. He loved to play the violin. And a lot of times at big uh, doings in Cleveland, they would call him to come and play the violin. Mm -hmm. And I guess he was a very good-natured, from what I have read, very good-natured man, a happy man. Well, you must get that from him then. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh -huh. coming in. Uh -huh.